Good evening. If uh, Ethan Sense, are you able to hear me? Yes, Dr. Hodges. You can see my screen. Ethan, can you yes, see I, my? Yes, I, yes, I can. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Good evening, everyone. Uh, sorry about the delay. We had a little technical difficulty. Um, I would like to welcome all of you um, for listening this evening as we um, unveil our draft health and safety plan, um, which is the roadmap to reopen in the fall of 2020. First, I'd like to just recognize the individuals on this screen for uh, taking the lead um, in planning under the pillar approach that we had shared uh, several months ago. And um, I really would like to thank Dr. Fox, Dr. Hunt, Mr. Peart, and Mrs. Dunkerley for their leadership um, that really uh, uh, brought together more than 40 individuals from across the school district. So what you'll be seeing tonight is a draft of our health and safety plan. And the reality is it is a draft, it's a work in progress and input is needed. And so this plan is a mandate by the Pennsylvania Department of Education and is required um, to open schools in green or yellow designation. The plan is, it must be approved by the school board. It must be submitted to PDE and posted to the district website. I wanna clarify and make sure people understand the Department of Education does not approve the plan. They just collect the plans. Only school boards approve the health and safety plans. The plans have to include several strategies. One is safely, uh, strategies to safely reopen schools, communicate with the public, and then provide professional developments to all of our stakeholders. And we all need to recognize that it's a living document that will certainly change as we learn new information and we receive new guidance. Um, these individuals are um, represented, um, other committees and other uh, perspectives and stakeholders this is the group that we actually brought together to write the draft of this health and safety plan. So I'd like to recognize their hard work, uh, their creativity and the efforts that they put in to put forth the draft that everyone is gonna hear about this evening. So here has been our timeline and I shared some of this with the community and with the board previously, but it just gives you a guide as to really what, what's been taking place. And, our roadmap to reopen started back in mid-May where we identified some key pillars um, that we would like to discuss with you know, important questions that would impact how we open schools, what to do once they open, and then when students are here um, to guide us. And that work started in early May. Then on June 3rd, we received guidelines that were released by uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Education. And that was the first time we learned of the requirement to develop a health and safety plan. June 5th, we actually received the template by PDE. Um, so we started, all started to make sense. School districts across Pennsylvania, reading the document, which is quite lengthy. Um, you all will see, um, I think our, our plan now is 39 pages. Um, so we, we, took, we took some time to gather how we wanted to approach the plan. June 19th is when we surveyed the community. Uh, and then we started to put together the health and safety team and actually begin planning and meeting um, over the course of the end of June, beginning of July. Then in early July, all school districts in Adams County, we got together with several individuals representing each school district and really discussed what our draft plans were with the idea that we would like to come up with some commonalities between each of us. Um, and it was, we found it to be a very productive meeting. And when we left, we found out that there were many, many common components of the plan um, across the county. Tonight, you're hearing the draft plan, and then moving forward, we'll be collecting feedback um, from the community, from the board, from our staff members over the course of the next week, with the ultimate goal of next Wednesday, July 22nd, um, to have board action on the health and safety plan. And then July 23rd, the day after, we'll be sharing out the, the plan that was approved, uh, along with uh, lots of other information, of which is going to be important that we need to collect some information from our community that will help guide our ability uh, to implement the health and safety plan. And then throughout the summer, it's really gaining input, communicate, revise, communicate again, gather more in input. 
So I'd like to share with everybody as we developed the plan and we met, um, this was early July, we considered um, several options and amongst option two, and I had shared out with the, uh, the community and with everybody, we considered many, many different hybrid options um, in the early part of the summer. And so I, I highlighted in the top right-hand corner, prior to the governor's executive order, uh, the group felt that this was our recommendation. We were recommending uh, K to six students um, come back face to face, seven through 12, we were gonna go with a hybrid schedule, which we would call cherry and steel, which is essentially an AB schedule. We also felt that it was important for our learning support students and our ELL students that they, they would actually attend school on all of those days. They would not use an AB schedule. They would com come to school on both A and B days. And then um, as you can see, uh, Eagles Academy is certainly the option for those who request it and those who are at high risk. And I wanna point out at the bottom that through this plan, we, we are proposing that we change the start date of school to August 24th, which is a Monday. And later on, I will talk about the why, um, that recommendation. So again, I want you to understand this was the recommendation prior to the governor's executive order. I want you to know the presentation you're going to see is based on that idea. However, what you'll see here, um, if you comply with the governor's order, and, and again, taking face coverings um, into consideration, and you know some of the survey, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, you know things that you should consider to open safely is a, um, a a hybrid approach for all students K to 12, um, or a remote learning option. And so I share that because of the uh, governor's executive order that requires six feet apart, or um, and or everybody wearing masks. And again, we will get to that uh, a little bit later on. So as we move forward, please understand what you're about to hear is based on the initial recommendation of opening schools using a K-6 face-to-face approach, hybrid learning 7 through 12. So the challenges of planning. The first, I really can't begin to, to share with you the massive amount of guidance that we've received. So early on, we weren't, we weren't really getting a tremendous amount of guidance, and then we started getting lots of guidance. Um, massive amounts, pages and pages and pages. And so we really tried to do our due diligence and read through to educate ourselves, um, to understand you know, other approaches that districts are using and trying to be creative, but it really was a challenge. Two is the interpreting the guides issued by the Pennsylvania Department of Education. So when those plans that they released on June 3rd and June 5th, many times throughout that guide, you will see the following language, when appropriate and to the maximum extent feasible, which leaves open a wide array of interpretations for entities. So that was a challenge for us in planning. The third challenge, and I hope, I hope, many of the, hope this resonates with many of you, is really managing the expectations of the Bermudian Springs families, students, staff, and the community. Um, we certainly have been hearing from a variety of people. And so one of the challenges, is how do we manage the views and expectations of everybody to come up with something um, to, to put forward? And then prioritizing health and safety within a school setting. We've received guidance from the CDC, PA Department of Health, Department of Edu Education, and the American Academy of Pediatricians, amongst so many other entities. But again, those were, were um, entities that provided direct um, guidance for schools. And the, ultimately, I think we all have to have the understanding that there are absolutely no strategies that can completely eliminate the transmission risk within a school setting physically coming here. And I think that that's important. And the language that you'll hear and, and read about is mitigating. And so you know, what are mitigation strategies? And the reality is what happened in the spring that began on Friday, March 13th, was a mitigation strategy by closing schools. And so that is an example of a mitigation strategy. So in early June, we asked um, you know, our families to complete a survey. And so I'm gonna go through those results. First, um, this is just a grade level pie chart. What I wanna share is that we had 1,002 responses, which represent represents a return rate of 55%, which I think is, is amazing and really gives us some good guidance um, statistically to be able to make some assumptions about the total uh, population. 
what you can't see here is the percentage by grade level is fairly consistent. There wasn't a, a large uh, pocket of people at any one grade level. It fell within that um, seven to, to nine or six to nine percent range. So the first one of the first questions was, if we are in green, which we currently are, um, how likely are you to send your children back to school? And this time we said on August 20th. Based on the survey, you can see that 90.7% of the 1,002 respondents said that they are likely or very likely to send their children to school in green. If we move to yellow, the number dropped to 73.5, who are likely or very likely to send their children to school in yellow. When asked about masks, and as I will send my children to school wearing a mask, 38.5% said that they are likely or very likely to send their children to school wearing masks. And again, I want to preface, this was a survey that was done on June 19th. And I think we can all recognize that since then, across the country, you have seen hotspots pop up that the, the, the landscape has changed with regard to COVID-19. So I want to make sure that we all get that. This is, this is a little bit of old data, but again, it's relevant data. With regard to transportation, um, if the guidelines limit the number of students on a school bus, we basically want to know, would people be able to bring their children to school? What does that look like? 42% responded that they are able to provide transportation to and from school. That's a pretty significant number when you're looking at the total population that we have to transport. And actually 31.8% responded that they sometimes will be able to provide transportation to and from school. So when you put those together, if they happen on the same day, we're well over 70% um, would be able to bring their children to school, which actually puts, you know, puts forth another problem of how do we stage people coming to school with buses with the parent drop off? And we would definitely would have to work through that. But again, this is information that was valuable as we, we looked to, to creating a plan. We also wanted to begin to understand if there was an opt out of any face to face instruction who was already considering using our alternative program Eagles Academy that is our own online cyber program. Based on the survey at the time 10.3% responded that they are very likely to opt out of face to face and select Eagles Academy. I also want you to take a look at the pie chart and you'll see that 21.3% said that they were likely and you know and I what I would say now to individuals after we roll out the draft plan and recognize it is a draft plan. This plan is not finalized. I think it's important that we share what the plan is so that people um, can educate themselves, think about their families and make the best decision for their families. How should school open? Um, overwhelmingly, the first choice was face-to-face. -face. More than 70% of individuals said face-to-face. -face. And then it slowly went down to uh, hybrid was the second choice at about 20%, and then third choice, 10% uh, was full remote. So here's a summary. Over half the families responded. Nine out of 10 families said they send their children back in green. If we go to yellow, it drops to seven out of 10. One and a half out of 10 families would send their children back to school wearing a mask. Um, they were very likely to, and if you had likely, it's 2.3 out of 10 would do that. Four out of 10 families said that they could provide transportation, and that increases to six out of 10 um, if we include the sometimes. So what was the purpose and goal of the survey? You know, it was really the, the responses at the time were based on our ability to maximize face-to-face -face instruction while maintaining a safe learning environment that adhered to the guidelines. The reality is that guidelines have changed since then. Many things have changed since then. But at that point in time, that was the purpose of the survey. And again, I want to point out, there are no strategies that can completely eliminate the transmission risk within a school. And at the bottom right, you'll see the, win the survey window was open from June 19th to June 26th. So what are the key components of our plan? First key component, we work to create cohorts of students that minimize interaction between groups of students to the maximum extent possible. And I'll go back to the PDE guidance that was issued to us and that phrasing. You'll see enhanced cleaning and hygiene practices in classrooms, hallways, buses, et cetera. Um, you'll see an effort to increase social distancing to the maximum extent possible. Regular monitoring of student and staff health. health. And the reality, this is a, a responsibility of everybody. Everyone has a role to play in that particular uh, process. 
And then finally, employing rapid communication and containment protocols. We have to communicate with staff, families, the Department of Health as appropriate um, are all key components. And again, another key component for us is um, proposing to change the start date to August 24th. So now each of those key components, I'm gonna share some detailed information about what it looks like, what you could expect. So minimizing interactions. And again, the proposal originally was K to six face-to-face -face hybrid seven through 12. So the goal was the students to stay with the same classmates. Um, core content teachers will move into the students. So we would not have students going from this ELA class walking over to the math class. We would rotate the teacher in and again, to minimize interactions with other students. We do want students to be able to go to specials. We would try to develop a schedule that minimizes uh, crossing paths and hallways um, and interactions that they would have. So we would try to come up with a schedule that would allow that to happen because we do believe it's important that kids move um, throughout the day. What does this look like in seven through 12? You know, approximately 50% of the students attend, attend school at a time. We would organize it by last name. And I would share, um, if you have children in the home that have different last name, we would group them together so that you wouldn't have a separation within a family. Um, as the, the, the traffic flow within buildings, we would try to minimize the walking in the hallways to the maximum extent possible. And the reason I wanna take, take a minute or two to explain the reason for the K to six, seven to 12 separation. As you get into seventh grade, your academic programming changes. You know, your programming uh, allows you to select electives and to go to more specialized courses. And what that means is you have a greater mixture of students. And so again, with the overall philosophy of trying to minimize the interaction between students, we believe that we can get relatively close to the 50% rule by splitting the alphabet and having uh, different students come in. So that was the rationale between the, the split. So what, fam what can families and students expect? New procedures for visitors entering or entering our schools. And we pushed out earlier that we just really don't want drop-in visitors. We want them to be scheduled with appointments and we will do everything possible to make that happen virtually. Uh, but we really want to minimize people from the outside coming in. And, and the caveat, which is written in our plan, obviously if there's an emergency, that happens. We're not going to turn away a parent who has a family emergency from coming into our school um, based on the circumstance. We're looking to have fewer students on playgrounds, in hallways, cafeterias. Um, we also are going to look at changes to activities beyond the school day. And I made sure I put activities, not just extracurricular, but activities, which could be concerts, back to school night, athletic events, all of those other things that happen after school, we're gonna to have to look at how we can change that approach. Enhanced cleaning and hygiene. Should go without saying now that we need to increase hand washing. We will have signage up in all buildings encouraging that. It will be part of instruction about um, what that looks like, how to do that. I think that that's been you know, ingrained in some of us now for several months is, is it's really, well, that's no different when we come back to school. Hand sanitizer availability. We had it before. Now we're going to have much more and many different places to make sure that uh, people have access to it um, and face coverings when necessary. I will talk about that later in this presentation. <coughs> what can families and students expect? Water bottles. We are not going to allow water fountains to be utilized. Fortunately, we have a number of water fountains that actually are bottle fillers. We will allow those to be used. In the case of the middle school um, that we all know is aging, um, we do not have any uh, water fountains in our middle school that have bottle, bottle fillers. So we've ordered those um, to make sure that we can have at least one on each floor so that students can access that. So again, students will be able to bring water bottles in school. New procedures for using the restrooms. We're gonna to try to limit the number of people in the restroom. Um, as much as possible. No sharing of instructional materials unless they can be thoroughly cleaned between uses. Let me give you some examples where you may go into a, a, an art classroom and you might share uh, colored pencils. Well, we're gonna try to create a schedule where maybe they're doing different activities or that we create uh, where that student uses their own personal set of um, colored pencils. Um, if you're doing math and you have manipulatives, we want students to have their own so that we're just not sharing. In the event we have to share, we wanna make sure that we can wipe them down, clean them before the next student would um, use those tools. 
buses clean between the secondary and elementary run, as well as between the uh, morning and afternoon runs. And I wanna share, we're still working through this with our bus companies. We recognize that this could cause a delay in transportation, but again, we're trying to be mindful and practical um, to create a safe environment. So we will work through that, but ideally this is, um, this is what we would uh, like to have happen with cleaning of the buses. Social distancing, what does this look like in K to 12? Okay, so early on in the Pennsylvania Department of Education guidance, it was very clear social distancing in their mind was three to six feet, okay? So if we can create an environment where we can get students three to six feet away, that was, that was okay in the minds of the Department of Education. Then you had the governor's order, which changed things, and that had ripple effects. So what I'm sharing with you are what we believe we can, we can accomplish in a typical classroom. And I say typical. We have some rooms that are bigger that fall outside of this. Um, Dr. Fox and I, along with several of our administrators, personally went down the room, set them up, put desks in rooms, and this is what we found. To be six feet apart in our classrooms, we can only have 18 desks. We can have 21 desks at five feet, and we can have 24 at four feet. Those are facts. That's what we can accomplish. That's important. Everybody keep that in mind as we begin to discuss the plans um, at the end. We also know in, in the green phase guidance that um, two, in the green, we should have 250 people, less than 250 people gathering socially. That's the key. And so we've had to get clarification to bring kids back to school in general, you'd have more than 250. The key word is socially. And so in my mind, socially for us are cafeterias, that's a social time, even though it's within a school. And so the number is, it has to be less than 250. If we move to yellow, the number drops to 25. Um, but if you didn't see today, the uh, governor made uh, some clarifications and modifications to the latest executive order that creates some new guidance in there that were, it just happened several hours ago that we're waiting to see if it impacts schools. And it has to do with the number of people in an inside setting that's permissible and the number of people at an outside setting. Um, we need to wait and see if it has an impact on us. If it does, it will be significant based on the guidance issue today. So what can families and students expect? Last furniture with desk and rows facing the same direction. So this hits me at the core because we've worked very hard in this school district about creating a learning environment that promotes collaboration, working together, um, and being comfortable to learn, whatever that looks like. But the reality is that that, that that environment is not quite possible given the circumstances that we're in. Um, the room that we set up with the six feet, five feet, and four feet with the number of desks, that's all that's in the room. No bookshelves, we don't have other things. And so we wanted to focus on the core first and then see what we can accommodate in classrooms. Um, what can families expect? Virtual events. And again, going back to after school activities, either canceled or presented in small groups, looking at creative ways to do those types of things. Face masks and shields. Uh, otherwise, if we refer to face coverings, that really covers both of those. And the Pennsylvania Department of Education guidance, they uh, indicated that it's face coverings. So what does this look like for staff? We must comply with the governor's executive order. Part of my role as superintendent of the school district, I'm a commissioned officer of the state of Pennsylvania. Um, I don't have the capability to defy an executive order. I could, but I also take my responsibility as superintendent very seriously. That's my responsibility uh, in my role to protect us as a school district from outside entities and make sure that we're, uh, I, I took an oath to uphold the uh, constitution of Pennsylvania and all applicable laws. So that applies to this. Me as the superintendent um, are not able to go against them, go against the executive order. What does it look like for staff? You can wear a face mask or a face shield. We will be providing a face mask um, for all employees. We also have face shields. It'll be a personal choice. The expectation is that they'll be worn into buildings, hallways, large common areas. And the also expectation is that they'll be worn by staff members when they cannot maintain social distancing of six feet. That's the governor's executive order. Why that's important, the previous guidance by the Department of Education had three to six feet. And so now it's, it's, it's at six. If you can be any less, you have to wear a face covering. 
What can families and students expect? Again, same uh, expectation for the governor's order. Um, the other key piece for transportation is that the face coverings must be worn on school buses. We are going to go with a two student per seat uh, on a school bus. So face coverings are expected on a bus so that we can bring, excuse me, students to school. Now, if you're a family and you have three siblings, they can sit together. We're not gonna make you separate because you're already in the same household. So we would um, create a situation that allows that to happen. For students, they must be worn in buildings, hallways, large common areas. Again, go into the restroom, wear it. You go to a special going down the hallway, we want masks worn. They must be worn by students at all times when they cannot maintain social distancing. That's what the current um, order says. Monitoring students and staff, what does this look like? We're gonna make accommodations to the greatest extent possible for students and staff with underlying health conditions. We're gonna work with every individual to try to meet your needs to the best of our ability. This is important to me. I know it's important to all of you. Um, we will, we will go do everything that we can. I'm trying to be realistic and saying, um, I don't know if we're gonna be, be able to meet everybody's demands, but we are gonna make every single effort. Um, our administrative team will make every effort to make that accommodation. We're gonna ask our staff to self-screen at home. We've been doing that during the summer and that will continue. We will, uh, nurses and staff will be looking for symptomatic students. We will be conducting training about what those signs and symptoms look like to make sure that it's not just one person's responsibility, it's everyone's responsibility um, to look for that. We, we, are, we must create isolation rooms in a building for a six student or staff. That is a requirement by the Pennsylvania Department of Education. In the event that we think something, somebody is symptomatic or asymptomatic, we have to isolate them and have processes and procedures for that. We must also have detailed processes for suspected or confirmed COVID cases within a school. I will share with you on a national level, we have a 28 page document for just this alone. Um, our solicitors provided us with a nine page document of how to handle that. The reality is, and I posed this question to the, the Secretary of Education in the meeting last week and, and, and said, in my opinion, that our process and procedure in York Springs, Pennsylvania should not be any different than something that happens in Erie, Pennsylvania or Tioga, Pennsylvania. The process and procedure for this should be consistent. And we were told that we believe that there will be some guidance coming out from the department about that exact item so that all school districts can be very consistent in how we, we handle that process. So what, what can families and students expect? Um, again, we are going to ask all families to conduct the wellness screening at home. We will educate. We will share what that looks like. Um, we will help. And I'll, I'll, I have a couple pieces of information on a later slide that you'll see what I mean. You can expect a conservative approach when sending students home from school. Calls from the nurse. Communication and response. What's it look like? We're going to be proactive and conservative from the health room with protocols and procedures. We will have to utilize contact tracing when appropriate. Again, detailed process for confirm. The other reality is, is that we have to be prepared for the potential for rolling closures, restrictions, quarantines. We, 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 it, we're already planning for that. I just think it's important that everybody recognizes that, that we have to be nimble and flexible and adaptable. What can families expect? A letter or call home if there's a concern about possible exposure. That'll be a process. We will make sure that we're communicating out. We'd also love two-way communication. That comes from us to families and families to us. The more we can communicate, the better we're going to be. To me, any question or concern regarding the health uh, of the students is one that should be asked. So I wanna make sure that there's a two-way communication. The final piece that, that we've been working on and I've been working on is a parent helpline. Um, I've been able to make some connections with uh, Geisinger Medical Center. Um, I have a, a personal a friend who is the medical director of the Children's Hospital at Geisinger Medical Center. And we set up a town hall meeting with superintendents last week with their uh, infectious disease specialists, their pediatricians, and to, to really help and guide schools. Geisinger has a free hotline where people can call to get advice. And so in my mind, I wanna try to provide help to parents in the morning through the home screening. If you're unsure what to do, I wanna give you a place that you can call that's free. So I'm working on that. I will push that out when we have it solidified, 
because the reality is, is we only have three school nurses in our district. They cannot handle that potential. I also don't want them to be up at five in the morning taking a phone call when this could be happening. So we're doing everything we can to make this a capability, really in an effort to help our families. I know that some families through their own healthcare can actually has this availability, but I don't know that. So I also want to build in an added layer that we can have people reach out, talk to somebody, get some guidance on what to do. Eagles Academy. I'm really proud of our Eagles Academy. It's, we've started this um, program um, years ago, more than 10 years ago. And it's really uh, become a pretty vibrant program and an option for our students. Eagles Academy is a comprehensive K-12 cyber program that's um, operated by Bermudian Springs. It's standards aligned. Our teachers are the graders. Um, Eagles Academy in the past has ensured continuity of education that allows for students to participate in activities. And so we've had students who have had health issues going to Eagles Academy. And then, it, and then when they become well enough to come back to school, they're able to transition easier back into the school because of our um, flow and understanding of the content and our management. New uh, coming up, we actually will be taking over the technology and support um, for Eagles Academy. And that is in the works right now. I'm excited about that so that we can better support our students um, with their tech needs and questions that they would have. And at the end of the day, you earn a Bermudian Springs High School Diploma, which we think carries such tremendous value. Now, this next slide is just the reality. I share this because I think people need to understand this. And so we, we know people are going to opt out from whatever method we choose to come back to school. Last school year, we spent $990,000 um, for students attending cyber charter schools outside of Bermudian Springs. Um, the reality is, is that we have to reimburse cyber charters at those costs. And when we do that, at the cost that that, that takes, that takes away from our ability to provide programming and supports and meet the needs of our students here, okay? So what we're asking, if any parent wants to opt out, please, please consider Eagles Academy. For every dollar sent to a cyber charter school outside of the district, you can see it takes away. So last year we had 71 students at $990,000. And I want you to see the data here per student is as of now, we will get mid-year new numbers. We are charged $11,000 per student, um, if they're a regular education student for a cyber charter student or school, and if they're a special education student, it's over $21,000. I am extremely pleased to tell you that we've got our price point for Eagles Academy, okay, hold on to this, that we can provide that I'm really super proud of. For a secondary student, we can do it for $1,500 now, and for an elementary student, we can do it $2,000. We've been working really hard and many people to, to work out um, a contract with the content provider that we've had for a number of years, which allows us access, accent, access to content more cheap, cheaper, but it's high quality content. And again, the impact that it has by bringing technology in-house and providing support, that's where we believe uh, those numbers are for our own Eagles Academy now. So what now? Key calendar of events, July 22nd next week is the next board meeting where we hope to have the calendar uh, approved with the changes and that we have our health and safety plan approved. The very next day, our plan is to email out to families and survey families. We will email, email out the approved health and safety plan where we are going to ask families to select their instructional option. We need to know what people would plan to do. In addition, we also need to know related to transportation. And I put up here uh, transportation that we want people to opt in or opt out. Um, we may just say that part of that sign up is that you need to opt in to transportation versus in the past, we've just assigned buses. And again, we're trying to be um, responsible um, and trying to be efficient in how we do that. So that we'll make the decision in the next few days about how we'll collect that information. Communication, emails, phone calls, surveys, website, and what I ask is, please call, please ask, please seek clarification. And I would encourage anybody to reach out to your building administrators, ask a member of the team, 
Um, this is certainly one of those that I'd rather people be not left wondering that we, um, we pick up the phone and I know we've gotten, you know, I know that I've received some emails and we're all pretty responsible of getting back to individuals. Um, and certainly we'll make every effort to call the answer questions that we can actually answer. So again, so work in progress. So how do you provide input to the plan? Um, tomorrow, I will be emailing the community um, with the draft plan, uh, a copy of the presentation, and there'll be the ability to click the link here, and I have it embedded here, where you can go out and fill, back, fill out a feed, feedback form. What we're asking everybody, there's a section, if you have a question, pose a question. If you have a concern, pose your concern. But we really would like one for each. If you have multiple, fill out multiple forms. That'll actually help us um, pull the information together and make some sense of it versus having multiple in um, any one line. Here's the reality. We need to be prepared to flip between any model that we choose over the course of the next, uh, I'll just say school year, whether that things get, you know, get better and we're able to get back to a full face-to-face -face whenever that happens, that we go into some type of hybrid approach or that we have to completely shut down and go fully remote. And I share that because I, it's important that people recognize that. I'm telling you as a, as a district, um, we are working on all of those options. It's a massive amount. It's a lot of our teachers. It's a lot of our administrators. It's just a lot of our support folks. It's a lot of everybody, but we're preparing for that. We think it's, it's, we're, it's just our responsibility to do that. So in general, that at a high level with some details is our draft health and safety plan. And so what we like to be able to do now is just have a, a conversation. Um, we have board members that are present. We have our administrative team members that are participating. And so what I'd like to do is, is open it up to questions, comments, um, so that we can have a, a, a discussion. Um, and then kind of, and we will at some point, uh, we have somebody monitoring for those in the public, uh, the email address where people could submit comments. We will be having somebody read those comments a little bit later on in this discussion. So members that are participating via Zoom, if you have a question, please don't forget to unmute. Um, we'll take that and then we'll go from, go from there to who, uh, who's going to respond. I'll open it up. All right, before we, before we actually start the discussion, I just want to say a couple of things. One is there is clearly no consensus on how to deal with this. There's no consensus even on, you know, you look at our community responses of how they're gonna to react to it. There's a lot of emotion around this. A lot of it's tied to whether your personal viewpoints, some of it's tied to your risk adversity. Some people aren't, you know, aren't overly concerned. I, I was sharing, I think I shared it with Matt. I said, you know, I have three health professionals in my family. I think I've heard four or five different opinions on, on how to deal with this. And none of them agree, which is, I find really uh, entertaining. So remember that, you know, as we're sharing, we're gonna have, we're, there's gonna be different viewpoints. And, and at the end of the day, we're gonna need to come to a consensus on how we support our students. We're here for the students first. And you know, that, so that's, that's where we want the, the focus to be. This isn't the one thing I really don't wanna to have to go down the road, this, you know, no politics. Cause unfortunately the thing that's really muddied this has been a lot of politics. And I, you know, we've never had that problem. Uh, and, you know, let's just kind of remember that what we're here for, you know, besides the money and the glory, but so anyway, all right, that's, Shane, Thank I have you. a question. If you could speak to, I'm unmuted, yeah. Um, so you talked about the, the Eagles Academy and um, for people who aren't familiar with that's the like cyber option that we already have and we've had for a really long time. And you talked about the costs with that. Can you talk a little bit about the cost and benefits versus remote learning, how would a remote learning option, or if we are forced to go fully remote, how would that look different than the Eagles Academy, or wouldn't it? Great question. Actually, it would. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that you asked that. So um, under Eagles Academy, that is a, that is a curriculum um, that we, that is provided to us by a third-party vendor, okay, uh, that's 
been standards based. It's 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 a, a packaged program, so to speak, for K to 12. OK, if we go full remote learning, that will be our teachers creating our own content um, that is shared out. That's the difference between the two. Now, Eucalyptus Academy, we have teachers that are graders, so they just grade content. We have people that act as mentors and a mentor in Eagles Academy is, hey, you know, Jen, um, how are you today? Do you need any help? Um, is everything okay? They're not there to instruct or to teach you. They're there to just really support you through the process. Of, and sometimes they have to reach out to, to teachers and graders to say, hey, what's, what's happening there? But 100% remote is Bermudian Springs through and through K to 12, our content using our LMS, which is Canvas. Um, and also the platform uh, that we'll be using at the elementary level is Seesaw, which most people are familiar with. And so that'll be our own content, our own teachers kind of working back and forth with families. And the other difference too, and again, we learned from this past spring, we will be embedding some synchronized learning through our own, if we want 100% remote, that is an expectation. We will be having uh, videos that folks can go in that aren't live, but we'll be able to get some guidance. And so those are some things that we've stood up that are a significant difference from the spring that we've learned from, that we're just getting better at. And actually we're training teachers. And again, I wanna, I wanna so Mr. Wool shared, not only is it important to do what's best for our students, we also have 250 staff members that are coming here every day that we care deeply about, that we have to be mindful of as well as we look for this plan. So thank you. Um, can, can you put slide 33 back up there just for a second? I think that is, uh, to, to quote the, the Mike Wool, that's a huge lift. Is that what you said, Mike? Before? That's a huge lift. And uh, I, I look at the administrators and I think, holy cow. So we, you, you're going to have teachers preparing and I'm, and I'm thinking, are, are they already working on this stuff now? I think you should be commended for that because I think that's a huge lift to be prepared in those three scenarios. And uh, I, I, I'm, I'm impressed with that because that's, again, that's a huge lift. Because uh, my fear is, I mean, I fear for these guys phone calls that they're going to get. I think I sent you an email about that. The phone calls, I, you know what it's like to get a phone call about a kid that has lice, let alone uh, what you might be facing in the fall. And uh, holy cow. So God bless you. But to be prepared for all three of these is, uh, is remarkable. And I, I commend everybody sitting here for that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Rich. I'll share with you that um, over the past couple of weeks, we've had more than 50% of our staff members participate in Canvas training, building out content in the last two weeks. Can I ask one more question? If, if in fact, I'm, I'm still on, I think. If in fact we end up, God forbid, we have to go to scenario three again, those kids that are in Eagles Academy would stay in Eagles Academy, right? Yes, and so uh, thanks for, and that's another point of clarification. What our ask is going to be, when we ask people to select their instructional option, it's with the expectations that you commit for a marking period. I don't want to be naive to think that we're not going to reevaluate, but really in an effort to help, I'm going to take it marking period by marking period. And so the commitment would, would be, um, even if we flipped in the middle of that full remote, those students would stay in Eagles Academy, okay? Um, at least that's what I say now. You know, if, if there's a situation where somebody wanted to come back and, and jump to our remote learning because we saw it was gonna be for a, a longer stretch, we would try to work through that situation. But the ask now would be commit to a marking period um, for us. Shane, to piggyback on Rich's um, question about being prepared for each one of those, I, I can think of if I were putting myself in the place of a teacher and you know, in the beginning when I have time to figure out what does it look like to teach kids on a hybrid a b schedule so i would work on that curriculum and then as you move on in the year once you're a couple of weeks in all that preparation is like you have to keep your preparation rolling and so 
my concern is for those teachers who are putting their efforts into a B hybrid, they would maybe have Fridays to keep up with their content for the, the eventuality of switching to remote learning. What would happen with the teachers from K to six who are having a class in front of them every single day? Would we, or would we only have them do Monday through Thursday so that they would also have Friday as a remote planning day? Great question. Um, so here's, here's where we are on that. We believe that the AB model, that we need to have a flex day. At a flex day, students still work, they still access their content, okay? And it may be, originally we were looking at Friday, um, however, depending upon where we land with the hybrid, it could be a Wednesday. If we decide to keep the AB, same students together Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday becomes the flex day. It allows our cleaning staff to clean a little bit differently with no students coming in, but they're expected to work remotely. It would allow our teachers to plan, support students, collaborate, and continue to create content. And then the following couple of days, the, a new group of students would come in. So we've got a couple different models there. But yes, there would be a flex day. Where we landed on K to six. So teachers are still planning. And even if they're face to face, and, and some would say, well, that's what we've always done. You're absolutely correct. However, if you look at this slide, it is the expectation that we have as a district that we must continue to plan um, for remote learning and have digital content ready to go. We don't have the luxury of, of waiting to build out that content. So the expectation K to six teachers is we still need to build out that content, okay? So where we landed under the face-to-face, -face, and again, this will come down to the school calendar, we're looking at an every other Friday becomes a flex day for K to six. This allows a couple of things. It allows teachers the ability to plan, support students, to collaborate. It allows us to clean buildings just a little bit differently, but it also allows us to test our remote learning possibilities with K to six, because we are one to one five through 12. And we quickly had to spin at the elementary level, providing content, looking at the learning platform. We felt as a group and as a committee, as we began to plan, that it's important that we recognize the work that needs to be done by our K to six teachers. And that we also need to be able to test our system. So that if we need to switch to remote learning, we're able to do that. So if we went every other Friday, we can accomplish a lot with that model. But again, that's something that we're still trying to finalize, but the group that met, that's that's where we landed um, to, your, to your point. So let me push back just a little bit in the real world. I'm thinking of if I'm a seventh grade teacher and I expect to get my flex day every week. And if we are short on subs, you know, for some reason, um, I would foresee myself getting pulled as a flex, as a, te as a sub. Where? To the fifth and sixth grade who are there. Don't they all have flex days at that same time? Well, no, but we oh. could make it that way and then only have four days of transportation instead of five. But that's what oh, I'm, what that's why I'm pushing back. Yeah. No, I agreed. And I'll be honest with you, the thought of even thinking about substitutes, I, I can't even go there yet. The reality is it's going to be a problem. The reality is providing the, the core teachers um, of what that looks like is something that we still have to work through. Again, making accommodations for staff based on their, their mitigating factors. So I, I hear what you're saying. I don't have an answer for you yet. It's a problem that we will work to solve, but I can tell you that we're very mindful of the efforts of the staff, the, the planning that they have to put in. And that reality is, is that we, we want to make sure that, that those folks are comfortable too. And, and so in that, in that example, we actually, based on current certifications, could not take a seventh grade teacher to fifth or sixth grade because of their teaching certification. Um, you know, we, during the typical school, we have struggled with substitutes and have to get creative in what that looks like. Um, I will also share the reality. If we're building out content in our LMS, if the teacher's not there, they should still have access to content if we don't have a substitute. So it may mean that we need an adult supervision, something like that, but they will still have access to work. It'll just look different. I'm not saying that that's the perfect approach. This is something we're gonna have to work through and figure out how we can, how we can meet the needs. So with this, what I would say, if any building principal has anything to add to that type of question or response or some context, please feel free to, to add.
or not. Um, so I, I have a question. Um, what does the remote day on the, the Cherry Steel schedule, what does that look like for the student? When they're- The flex remote? day? No, not the flex day. So um, I'm in school oh, on Monday, I'm not on Tuesday. What am I doing on Tuesday? So on Tuesday. Um, the idea now is that you would, so Monday, you're with your teacher, you're getting, you're laying the foundation. And re this really lends itself to our project-based learning approach and really trying to build a foundation that you apply to other work. So the expectation would be that you gather what you need to know and you work, obviously guided work within that practice. Then there's some type of application that you would work on the next day and maybe even doing some pre-reading for the following day. Um, to support those students, um, teachers uh, during the course of their day have planning periods. So in the past, planning periods have been able to plan out content. The reality is, is we're gonna have to plan time for that teacher and other teachers to support students who are working remotely that may have a question. So if I'm a teacher and I have half of my students that are working remotely on you know, work that I'm setting up for the next time and I'm face to face with another group of students, we want to be able to set up a time to support those students. So we'll have to be strategic. Um, students will know when that teacher could be available. The reality is we could have some other teachers that could help and answer some of those questions. So here's a direct quote from a student. Oh, on that flex day, I'm just going to find the group of friends that I'm in school with or not in school with and hang with them. But the reality is, is, is the, expectation the expectation is teachers are still going to have work that they're going to be held accountable for. How they okay, choose to do all right. That. I just, I'm, yep. absolutely. absolutely. There's no different than <laughs> now. Students go home and they, over the weekend and they want to do work. The reality is there will be academic expectations. And I'll bring up, there will be grading. There will be attendance. Attendance will be taking on, on those remote days. We established a process for taking attendance on our flexible instructional days. We utilize that same approach on those non-face-to-face -face days. So there will be expectations. Okay. Uh, another question. So when you did, and I hate to open this can of worms up because it might mean you guys moving furniture again, sorry. But in the, in, you know, so your max was 18. What if you were able to put a plexiglass partition up between two rows? Would you be able to fit another row in? Probably. We've had those conversations. The reality is it creates um, much, much more cleaning that would have to be done from a touch surface and, and that. So we've talked about it. Matter of fact, it was a discussion on school buses about putting plexiglass up between seats on school buses, which got shot down. Um, but it comes to- that's, that's more of a safety. I would see more as a safety thing, but I, I, we, we, you know, that's what industries are doing. That's what restaurants are doing. You know, we were, my wife and I were out to dinner last week and we went to the restaurant and they had plexiglass like, you know, on carts, like it was, instead of a blackboard, it was a plexiglass between the tables, which was, you know. Not so great, the, was, what I'll also share with you, um, looking at numbers, if we wanted to get class sizes down to 18, how many rooms would we need at the elementary level? So I think Mrs. Ely, we said eight, eight additional rooms, right, or seven. And so, and so we would have to, it would, it would get close. close. We have, we have classrooms, but that, but that means, means we'd have to have seven additional teachers. teachers. We've got, we got space, space but we'd have, we'd have to have the people, the people to be able to do that. And that's, and that's just K to four. four. Then if you throw up five to six, we'd have, we'd have to add at least two or three more staff members to be able to make that happen. And space in the middle school will be a little bit more difficult because again, that building is unique in that we've got the fixed and face approach along with um, the hybrid model for two other grade levels. And so we've had conversations about auxiliary gyms and using spaces you know, differently. Um, and again, I think we could work to find space. We also need to have teachers in place and we're just not in a position to go out and hire eight or 10 more teachers to be able to accomplish it. It's just not, it's not feasible. So it sounds like we would have to have face coverings in most classrooms on the teacher as well as the students uh, under these, under the, face-to-face -face instruction. That's correct. So my understanding is that the face covering uh, has exceptions that people can opt out of wearing it. And I, who enforces it? How much instructional time is a teacher gonna spend reminding 
a student to put their mask back on? And what happens if you have one or two students who opt out? What's the, what What's do you the, propose? The, the process, actually this was addressed by the governor. It's been very clear for school districts. We are not allowed to ask, nor does a person have to give us a reason not to wear a mask. We are not permitted to ask why somebody doesn't have a face covering. Student. So if there's a, a, a room of 20 students and we say everybody's wearing masks and then one or two students choose not to wear a mask, then what, what do we do about the other people in the room who say, well, them not wearing a mask is putting me at risk, whether it's the teacher, whether it's other students, what, what, what do we do about that? Based on the executive order, there's nothing we can do. And, and again, I, I don't want to minimize, there are some people that can't wear them, okay? But we as a school entity are not allowed to go up and say, can you give me the reason why you're not wearing that? I, uh, and again, if I shared, we, are gonna we have enough masks to provide every student. Um, we are also looking at face shields for our youngest students because of the, uh, the linguistics of learning and what it takes to become a reader. We think it's important you see the math and work through that. We, we're working on providing that. Um, we've ordered, we have thousands of masks on hand um, and we're getting more so that we can provide them for anybody that doesn't have one. We'll provide them on school buses, okay? We're also looking, um, if families don't have thermometers at home to take their child's temperature, uh, providing them for families, we're working on that as well. And again, we're gonna make every effort to support to the best of our ability, support families. Um, you, you mentioned earlier about moving the start date from August 20th to 24th. You'd say you would yeah, elaborate. Yeah, that, thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. Matt. Also then too, if it, also then maybe if that date could maybe be also changed in the future, that maybe it could go longer or not longer. So the rationale, we were supposed to start on a Thursday. Okay. And so once you're looking at a possibility of an AB schedule uh, with a flex Friday as a possibility, we don't want to start at the end of the week. It also provides us as a district the opportunity to be with our staff for five consecutive days. I, we can't mandate staff to come in to do things over the summertime. So we have professional development days built in. And so we're looking to take this time the week before to make sure that we are as ready as we can be for students from content to collaborating to, to actually maybe even simulating some of the schedules and kind of walking through and, and as a staff, we think it's important that we get together just kind of like the students and we haven't ironed that out yet. So that time would be dedicated to PD that's in the plan. Part of the professional development that we typically want to have to do is how to educate people on the signs and symptoms. You know, we also need to make sure that, that we're all on the same page with how we're going to open up school and each school is working on that. But the reality is, is we can't just jump right in and forget that this last spring didn't happen. We need to talk with our kids. We need to start to build relationships. We need to continue the relationships that we have. And we need to understand where they are physically, emotionally, academically, and then use that information to really start to tailor their education moving forward. And so we want to make sure that, that we've allowed time for us as professionals at the buildings and as a district, that we have time to work on that. And so we will be doing some things um, as a district, and I'll share with you, even typically we start this school year, I bring everybody in the auditorium, all the staff, I, I will not do that now because of the over the 250 group. So at this point, um, I, I, I'm suggesting that we as a district, we're gonna shift our day and our PD day on the first day will be from 1.30 to 9 p.m. And we'll actually meet out in the stadium where we all can be six feet apart to have our first professional development day as a group. So there's an example of how we need to be creative to accomplish things together, um, work together. That's different. I know it's asking a lot of staff, but I think it's really valuable that we actually get together and, and talk about some things and, you know, get together on the same page, just, just as an example of, of starting. The, the one thing maybe then to, I don't know how feasible this is. You can speak to that then too, that like Rich was saying about how for faculty and staff to have enough time to maybe get ahead or that planning, would it be, is there any idea that maybe you could build even more of the PD days at the beginning, maybe delay the students 
coming back until later in the school year, just in that way that gives the, the teachers more time to maybe get ahead, like Jen was saying. So if they go remote or whatever schedule we're using at that time, just to give as much time as they can in August to get prepared and ready for any eventuality. Is that feasible? Is that doable? Yeah, it is. And we, we thought about that. The other piece, again, remember as a county, we got together and we have consortiums with counties. So we really were trying to all adjust schedules to be somewhat consistent. There are a couple school districts in the county that are actually going after Labor Day, but that's because construction projects got delayed. And so that's why they shifted to a later date. So it seems like that 24th is more consistent, but what I'll share with you is those flex days where we're working together become built in time that we can use as we, as we go forward throughout the course of the school year to be able to do just what you're saying. Because we've, listen, we've thought about, do we, do we delay till after Labor Day? And we thought about what do we gain by doing that? We, we definitely gain some more time, but it also delays our ability to get in front of students. And, and listen, um, we're also, you got cold and flu season that comes in the middle of the winter. And so what does that look like? How do we differentiate between cold, the flu, and, and COVID, every school district is going to be facing that. And so there's some goal of we, when we come back, how we come back, that we try to maximize up front, what can we do face to face? And that kind of led to that, that 24. Because I got to be honest, originally I was proposing to keep it the same. And then we kind of landed on the 24th. You're, we're actually seeing a lot of colleges are bringing their students back a, a little early, keeping them until Thanksgiving, and then they're done and not going back until February because of that, the cold and flu season. Shane, are we talking, I, I assume we're talking about the regular school day start and end time. And I know you had mentioned your displeasure with having to have desks in rows facing forward. And I know kids aren't gonna get that social time in the cafeteria. They're gonna kind of miss some of the really valuable social stuff that they rely on at school. Um, and also I uh, tried to wear a mask for seven hours the other day and I, I didn't love it. And I'm just wondering, do we, if we're gonna do it five days a week with the K through six, do we consider shortening shortening the school day and for the students. And that again would give the teachers an, an hour or two at the end of the day to get their stuff remote. I don't know if you've considered that or not. We have, we actually considered making the day the same for elementary secondary. We've considered shortening the days. Um, we've definitely have considered all of those and the impact it would have on transportation. Uh, you know, families, if, if a student, if they, you know, they're getting off the bus at a time that's different than the typical work day. Uh, and again, this is what's helpful because I, I want to hear, you know, your perspectives. Um, you know, we, we've seen, um, you know, some of the data from community, we've heard from our staff. And so it, it definitely was a thought. It would be challenging for us to, um, I don't want to say, it's all challenging. Um, if that was a if that was a desire that came out from the community and from 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 the board as a direction, we would look at see how we can make that work. But for me right now, that it, it would be it'd be a pretty big task. But I won't say that we wouldn't try to tackle whatever it would be. But it was a conversation that we had in our planning. I mean, one of the things that we really have to remember is the fact that, especially with our elementary kids, right? If they're at home, somebody probably needs to, should be in the house with them. And we have a lot of people that need to work. Uh, and, you know, I, ironically, I just got done with a meeting from 4.30 to 5.30 talking about it from the employer side. How are we going to help our associates that whose kids can't go back to school because school's closed, you know, and, and, you know, and, and so on. Yeah. So that's going to be something that, you know, we have to kind of take in all kind of viewpoints. Right? If, if we went 100% remote, or if we have to at that point, is it possible to, for some families who absolutely cannot have an adult at home, is it possible to bring those kids in? Because I know last fall or last spring, we had a lot of um, the, the people who help in the classroom, the teacher's aides and stuff like that, and they didn't really have 
anything that they could do. Would it be possible if we go 100% remote to accommodate those families in the district? If it's 10 or 15% who can't who can't do it, can we have those students come to school, be socially distanced in rooms that are six feet apart so they don't even have to wear masks, and have the teacher's aides kind of proctor so that those students are receiving the same quality remote education that they would receive from their living room? Yeah. Yes, this has been a conversation. If the order, I, if the order is the same as was issued in the spring, that's, that's what I was going to get to. No. We could consider it if the if the if the situation that caused us to go fully remote allowed it to happen. But I think it's a it's a concern that I have. Again, I want to try to help family. I understand completely, and so if the situation allowed it, we will do everything we can to allow that to happen. So it's not that we're providing, you know, that teacher, but a place for people to go that need assistance. Absolutely. If, if we had um, the flexibility um, in the, the color or the whatever made us turn to do, we will, I will guarantee you that we will look at making as many accommodations as we can to help. I, so if we picked the 100% remote learning at this point in time, the way things stand today, we could accommodate those families who remote is a struggle for. Yes. But if the governor changes the, the plan and says, oh, schools may not open their doors, we wouldn't be able to. But right now, as it stands, we could do that option and still accommodate those families. Yes. yes. Thanks. So let's, uh, okay, go ahead, Dave. subjects that are difficult for them. If the student wants to attend school rather than every other day, every day, in order to get the face-to-face -face instruction with the teacher, is, what is the percent that we could allow those students to come to school each day? Um, is, is, is there any thought to that? I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, Geometry, uh, chemistry, some of those applied sciences and, and core subjects that, um, you know, I remember struggling with some of them myself at times when I just needed that, that reinforcement from the face to face. Mr. Defoe, can I ask you to weigh in on that? Because that's been a conversation that we've kind of talked about. And so, from your lens at the high school, which your whole building would be. Would be impacted by that in middle school. So I don't know if you have some thoughts or what, what where you are in that potential. Yeah, I think the, the thing to consider there is the teacher was still kind of following the schedule of what happened. So I think a continuing uncertainty in some of the details that we have out of small areas um, for those type of situations. Um, you know, we'd have to consider them kind of on on case by case basis. Um, but you know, you're still monitoring, um, you know, all those other social components, the cafeteria and things like that. And that skews those numbers. So we'd have, we'd have to, um, I, I think that's one of those things. Once we get through a cycle or two, um, we'll have a much better feel for what that looks like and, and what, what that would be. And, um, you know, I think if you looked at a percent, maybe five, 10% would be that max number. And if, if the demand exceeded that, it may be then we'd have to assign those kids like you could come on Wednesday and you could come, you know, whatever that day may be. Shane, uh, what, what kind of uh, input have the teachers, what, what kind of feedback are we getting from the teachers about the scenarios? Yeah, so yesterday I rolled out the, um, draft plan for for the staff and shared everything that you saw tonight and and like most people um you know they're they're concerned about how we can keep them safe and so uh, there's been lots of conversation on the national level about transmission symptomatic asymptomatic and you know the reality is is we have many teachers that are they're older some have pre-existing conditions that could be impacted and so i would say that there's a there's a high level of concern uh what i can appreciate is they all recognize the challenge that's in front of us. There isn't one of them that doesn't get it. Um, but, you know, I think I shared the same 
you know, the, the model and the approach and people are waiting to see what that looks like um, so that they can plan. And I've encouraged everybody that we're, no matter where we are now, we need to make sure that um, we're still planning out content that we're still, because at the end of the day, we need to have that core content in our learning management system and on, and on Seesaw that's ready to go. And so um, I really appreciate their thoughtfulness. We had a great conversation yesterday that posed many questions similar to, to what's happening now. Um, and, and so, and, and I'm certain that there are some folks out there that are um, listening in tonight to kind of hear this, this conversation. Shane, do you have a, any kind of plan uh, in case teachers start getting infected and how we're going to cover the, those classes? Yeah, I mean, I mean that's part, part of, of the, the um, that's part of the, the protocols that have to be in place if somebody suspected or has it and then we'll have to do contact tracing. And so, you know, the reality is um, if somebody, students have been in contact with a teacher or suspected or has it in the last 48 hours, every one of those students would, would have to go into that, that protocol. And so um, the impact could be wide. And so, and I hate to say it, but if that happens, I don't know that we'd even be able to operate that course to have a substitute for based on, based on what the protocol is at the time. So we're still trying to work through the exact procedures. And I'll be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm holding out just a little bit in hopes that we do get the guidance that we've been told we're going to get from the department about how to handle that so that we're consistent. Um, but it's very similar. If you look at our athletic health and safety plan in a simple form, you can see, you can see if somebody has symptomatic and what the expectations are, if somebody tests positive, they'll be able to return having a couple negative tests. So it'll be within that framework. And then we'll do the contact tracing and ask people that have had contact within, you know, the last 48 hours to, to, self-quarantine until we can get some results and understand what the impact is there. And so that process is outlined in a very, very simple form um, in that plan. So if one teacher tests positive, then the whole, every class. So if there are, if we did the hybrid approach and, and there's really seeing like, you know, 300 students, all 300 students, who's been in contact with them would have to be quarantined for 14 days. And again, we're, we're, we're still looking to get a little bit of guidance and clarification on that from the department of health. Um, because, you know, and we've talked about, well, what's the threshold that you close everything down? Do you close the district? Do you close the school? Nobody can give us any answers on that. And so that's part of, of what we're looking for. And now you can understand why our ultimate goal is to try to minimize the number of interactions that actually, as we start to work through, would be a, uh, a positive to the hybrid model where before we were looking at a students, the a, a students would come in Monday, Wednesday, B, Tuesday, Thursday. That would be a reason to have the same students come in Monday, Tuesday, with a flat Wednesday flex day, and then the same students. Because now you, your interactions and your amount of time, you've, you've minimized the amount of interactions by going to that model because it would be the same students there for two consecutive days. I would imagine the protocol for contact tracing is going to determine, for example, is it the whole classroom or is it really only buddy people that came within X number of feet with you? Because when we do contact tracing in my work and we've been doing a lot of it, uh, it's typically people that have been in contact and usually for a duration. It's not somebody like where I just walked by you in the grocery store. Because I'll guarantee you, we all probably walked by somebody somewhere, somehow, that probably was infected and, you know, that we didn't get infected. So I'm thinking of my own high schooler. And I mean, my, my children really want to come back to school. They want to be here with their friends. I hope they don't listen to this. But <laughs> what I'm feeling, I'm, I'm hearing what the AB would look like. And it sounds like they would have the instruction Monday and Tuesday. And then there's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, where they're supposed to be working. And I can think of some of my children would probably have no problem with that and be diligent students. And I can think of others that really it's gonna fall on me as a parent anyway, because then, you know, how else are they gonna do it? And if they don't understand something, 
on Wednesday, they have to wait all the way until Monday to really get that teachers. And I understand we can have some supports. Whereas if we do remote learning, then I'm hearing that my kid would have a Zoom meeting every day, Monday through Friday, with one of our actual teachers and like daily follow up, like a remote class. So it makes me want to lean in that direction. I, I didn't hear that. What, what I wouldn't say is that it's an everyday Zoom expectation for synchronous learning. We're still trying to work through that, but that every day have that face to face. It could be done on an individual, but not a true schedule of classes. And again, those are details we're still trying to work out as far as synchronous learning contact with a teacher. So I, I don't want people to think that every day you're following the teacher, you're going to have live instruction with 100% remote. So it would be asynchronous, but it would be daily. There are, there's a, something to do today, something to do Tuesday. Absolutely, something. yes. Each day there's something yes. to do and it's yes. asynchronous. Your student can do it at 9 a.m. or at 9 p.m. And there will be some components to that, but there's going to be an expectation that you're going to need to touch base, whether it's a face-to-face -face during that day, yes. With the remote learning. Yep. yep. Hey, Shane, have we considered on um, the, the hybrid schedule having the teacher just do Basically, I'm gonna call it standard content, the way they do it today. The difference is uh, each teacher is Zoom enabled and the people that are not in the room are just listening to the lecture from. We've thought about that. And I know that there are some districts who've purchased external cameras, um, which I'll be honest with you, I, I didn't want to invest in um, going out and equipping every classroom with a camera, knowing that we have laptops. And so if we did that, it would tie the teacher um, to the computer, to the Zoom, so that they can hear and they, they could be seen. It was a conversation that we had, um, and we just, didn't, we just didn't land there for a recommendation. But that's not to say that kind of like um, Dave Reinecker's question earlier about can we support students, that doesn't mean that we couldn't if a student was at home and they wanted to hear the lesson again and it was a one or a two that we couldn't have something set up for that case on an as needed basis, it definitely, there definitely is the possibility to have that happen. So let's, um, at this, before we take another question, um, we do have somebody that is monitoring the email account where comments can be uh, uh, read. And so Mr. Peart, if you um, could take a look, I don't know how many we have, if you'd like to, to summarize um, if it's lengthy or to just read verbatim what somebody has out there, um, please. Sure. Right now we have two. Um, so this is from a uh, taxpayer residing in uh, the school district, a grand grandparent of a child enrolled in the district. She is a retired school nurse with 27 years experience, as well as over 40 years of experience as a pediatric nurse in various settings. Um, as a school nurse, she was educated about and involved in planning for eventual pandemic. Public health officials have long been aware that such a pandemic would happen someday. We did not expect it to be this chaotic. The COVID uh, virus is very dangerous to the entire population and is not in any way under control. I'm very concerned that school districts are feeling pressured to open school before it is scientifically prudent to do so. Instead, districts need to be planning how best to meet the needs of students in light of technology that is available. I'm well aware of the educational, socioeconomic, and mental health needs of children. I also understand childhood behaviors and their capabilities. Despite any planning on the part of adults, it will be near impossible to gain cooperation of children in wearing masks or socially distancing in schools. Children are also very resilient any loss of academic progress can be remediated. Um, foremost in any discussion, it must be kept in mind that these are not normal times and will not be for some time. Um, it is not only unfair, but uncivilized that some people believe it is now permissible to unnecessarily ask others to risk their lives for the convenience of others. We should be all concerned about our healthcare workers who really have no choice. We should be concerned enough not to make their jobs and their lives more difficult. Now school employees are being asked to put their lives on the line. Why is it now considered decent to expect teachers as well as other school staff to risk their health and their lives and their lives of their own families? How can 
we now justify that it is tolerable to send children to a building where we may be risking their lives. Any plan to open schools must have a contingency for the foreseeable event of COVID infections. At first, many staff and students will have to be quarantined and when the spread continues, schools will have to close. It seems better to use the time to continue training teachers for online learning and keep children safely at home than to endure so much risk only to close soon after opening. I implore you not to vote to open schools at this time. Uh, respectively submitted Nancy O'Neill, RN, BSN, MED. And then the next one is to the dedicated members of our school board. I'm reaching out to you today as a concerned parent. Please vote no to open our schools in August and vote toward funds to increase teacher professional development to create a more robust online teaching environment until it is safe to return to our buildings. As a secondary science teacher for the past 12 years, I know the impact that educators have on students in a typical face-to-face -face environment. I know the value of creating rapport and relationships within the classroom. As an educator, I am pleading now for my voice to be heard. The face-to-face -face instructor that is being proposed is in no way true face-to-face -face learning. Educators like myself that pride themselves on being student-centered will find themselves in situations where this is not possible. We will spend the days needing to stay away from our students and keeping our students separate. This will be potentially more detrimental to our students' mental health and self-esteem than to stay home and teach virtually where we can connect online without fear of health and safety. Um, amongst our community, there is a push for students to, to not to be required to wear a mask. There are parents quoting false news articles and not reading the scientific articles that are in favor of masks for both children and adults. In one of the articles I'm attaching, it states that there is no significant difference between the carbon dioxide and oxygen levels for children with or without mask. Clearly, they do not have an impact on how well children breathe. Um, furthermore, another article contains information from a study that states the significant lowering of cases in areas and people that are wearing masks. Governor Wolf has also mandated that masks should be worn in all public locations inside and out. What, are we, what will we do to ensure that this mandate is followed through? If a student refuses to wear a mask and no doctor's notice provided, what will the consequences be? Should you choose to allow students to remove their mask in classrooms? What will be done to protect their teachers? What will be done to protect the children that is wearing a mask? Um, memory, many members of the community feel as though it is in the best interest of their children to return to the building. In your survey, they listed academics as their main concern. If teachers were given the opportunity for professional development to make virtual learning better, I believe this new attempt would be tenfold what they were able to do in the emergency situation. I hope you support them and give them the opportunity to create a more robust remote learning program. As a parent, I was proud of the way our teachers and handled themselves this spring. With more practice, professional development, and time along with your support, I no remote learning is possible. Um, in the future, we will look back on this and we'll be judged on how we handle the situation. How many sick children and staff is enough for you to close schools? How many staff meetings are you willing to have to inform faculty that another one of their beloved students has fallen ill uh, from COVID? Please hear me, please see the science, know that no option is a fair option for all. The best option for the safety of our staff and students is remote learning. Sincerely, Lisa Smith. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to share a, a couple other things that we've done as a district based on this past spring. Uh, we did place an order and we currently have 100 hotspots um, in hand. And I've placed another order for an additional 100 hotspots in hand. There are T-Mobile hotspots. We've been out testing in the community and the reality, the coverage is very good. Even in some of our most rural areas, it seemed to be able to get coverage for the hotspot. So with connected to remote learning, um, Eagles Academy folks, we think we're definitely better positioned for those people who had um, no internet access to provide a hotspot so that they can gain internet access. And then also working um, with Eagles Academy students who need internet connectivity to also to try to provide that. I do want to share in, in our effort to try to get some devices um, to, to meet the needs of students. Obviously, most folks know that we're, we're Apple 
but we are looking to get some uh, Chromebook laptops for those who might want a laptop for Eagles Academy. Due to the worldwide demand for those devices, uh, we've been told that they will not come in until November. So fortunately, we do have some technology in the district that we can repurpose to try to meet those needs. But the reality is, is there's such a backlog um, for those type of devices because many folks were getting them um, that we're working through contingency plans until they would come in. So I did want people to know that we're, we're actively working on connectivity. Um, I also reached out to CenturyLink um, about how can we provide access to the internet through CenturyLink directly to uh, some of our families. And so that's still a, still a work in progress. So I did want to share that um, as part of how we're how we would look at even even if we went to the remote learning um, that's different from the spring. Other questions? Mr. Orwick on this one. Um, the PIAA, as far as I know, is still staying full speed ahead. Is that correct? That is correct. So we, we would anticipate having our fall sports and everything going. That's that's my I'm I'm not my, asking that's my direction. Asking. That's my direction right now and what I'm doing because of the guidance that we received. Right. I'm not asking for details, Dave. Okay. We don't have time for that. Okay. Uh, but but it's it's interesting to know. I mean Are you okay? Can you hear him? Okay, Dave. Th th so, in other words, though, we'll, you'll still be gathering eligibility, like grade eligibility, and all that stuff on middle school students and high school students. You're talking about the academic eligibility. Academic eligibility. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So well, kids are going to have to keep up with their stuff, whether we're fully remote or hybridly remote. That's, cor that's correct. We would use Sapphire to continue that process. Right. Right. I just wanted to clarify that. Yep. Thanks, Dave. Whoa. So somebody remotely had, had shared a question and it was, um, if the COVID numbers drops, we could resume full face-to-face -face learning with all students and whatever we make. Yes. And that's that I think what this slide represents that folks can see is that we want to be nimble enough that based on what it looks like and ideally we hope that we get to a situation that we can slowly get back to and I don't I don't want to be naive and say normal, because I don't, I don't know what that looks like any longer but really trying to provide as much face to face with students so I wanted to make sure that, that I address that so based on the situation, we will certainly try to create some flexibility within those plans if things get better to slowly open up and if things don't get better to slowly pull back. Sorry. I had a question more about um, cyber schools then. I understand that we want to try and um, influence or influence maybe, but want to try and convince people maybe that Eagles Academy is the right way to go. But do you have an idea yet of how many people might choose outside cyber schools? Do you have a number on that? And then also, is there a, a number then too that could have, like if it really does become dramatic, like could our enrollment drop enough that then it becomes a problem where we have to have a certain number of students? What, what number is that and what does that look like? Um, so yes, um, in that um, it, it is a concern. We don't have the number of people that would choose to go to an outside cyber. What we did know is that according to that survey back in June, 10% of our population said that they would opt for, opt for Eagles Academy. So that's adding an additional 180 or so students if that number to, were to hold true. And just to give you an idea, let's say that that 180 chose a cyber charter school outside of Bermudian Springs, okay? If they were all regular ed, just regular ed, it would cost the district $1.98 million in addition to what we currently have in the budget. It's significant. $2 million basically. And that's based on that, that 10%. So um, that's part of why when we push out and we, we make a selection that um, we're going to ask people to make a choice of 
who's opting, who's coming to whatever our plan would be, who's going to do Eagles Academy. And at that point, we'll know who's, who's already made some decisions outside of that to be able to respond. But there is a significant potential for a, a massive financial impact if people would go to a cyber outside of ours. Um, and again, and I respect the decisions that folks make. And so that's why we've done everything we can to enhance our own, our own program. Um, to meet the needs of our students. And I think that we have you know, 50 students or so that have been in the program prior to this. I think they've had a good experience. We've had many graduates. Uh, and I, I think it, uh, it provides a lot for students using our own teachers um, and is a, is a really good option if people aren't comfortable. So what's interesting is, I don't know if, I don't watch a whole lot of live TV, uh, but I know that in certain markets, the cyber schools are carpet bombing with commercials. I mean, it's like, you know, which this is a boon from that. Has there been any conversation about the state stepping in to put the brakes on, on this? So that's, so that's what, happened what happened in the spring. spring. So and so the state, state through um, Act 13 said that whatever your enrollment was by the date, I think it was even March 13th, that if you take on more students, you're not getting reimbursed anymore. And that was, that was cyber charter schools. Well, that legislation is now gone and there's been nothing new heading into the next school year. Um, it's been a, a topic of conversation. I think it's important for people to know and the community to know that um, we've had the experience at Bermudian Springs where students would be here. They enroll in a cyber charter school. Next thing you know, they're a special needs student. And, um, and we as a school entity are not allowed to ask for how, what they're identified for. Um, we're not allowed to get that information. And sometimes that, drives up the cost to over $21,000 when that happens. And so um, out of those, those students, if you start to sprinkle in um, you know, a, a student who's identified, that's an additional $10,000 per student for special education. So Shane, then looking at the, the difference, I think it's, it's really important for people to know and see the difference between the remote learning product that we could offer. It's not a cyber program. The remote learning is different. Yes. And it's something that our students could be in it together and still be able to do sports. Because if people go to outside cyber schools, correct me if I'm wrong, they can't play sports. Let, let, let me clarify, remote learning or Eagles Academy, because they're definitely two different. If we go to remote learning, right. if we, we would choose to go to remote learning while athletics would come in. If we're forced to go to remote learning, athletics would be right. would be completely out. And so the rule is that if the program, if the entity where a student registers, if they offer that activity, they may not participate in ours. But if we, but if they're in either Eagles Academy or remote learning, they can participate in sports. That is correct. Thanks. They can, any extracurricular. Can you um, explain a little bit then too, like what is the expectation that what we'll do next Wednesday then? So I understand the timeline again, but then next Wednesday then is the time then where we're going to decide the plan so, for the fall? So we're getting lots of feedback and I still have some questions that I want to pose to the group. And so we're going to gather information where you'll get a chance, everybody will get a chance to look at the details of the plan. So our charge next Wednesday is to come with a plan. Now, interesting, at the beginning of the plan, you choose your approach. So one of the approaches is hybrid learning, fully remote or, or fully back. You, it doesn't have the detail of how you're going to do it. That would be something that would be an addition. That would be the application of the plan. But my goal next week is that we have the plan cleaned up the way that we want it to be and we feel comfortable with, as well as our instructional approach. And that we would, that, that has to get approved. I have to send that to the Department of Education. Actually, some new documentation came out with a requirement to uh, the board has to improve an instructional time modification. I'm gonna let Dr. Fox talk, talk to that. To that. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, a few minutes. Minutes. in order for in us to us use a hybrid, hybrid approach or uh, a remote, remote learning, learning um, approach, approach, there, there is, is a, a, um, a section, section in the public, public school code, code section 520.1, that would, that would require, require us to complete um, a form and send that to the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Education. Um, as well as board signatures and approval, as well as the documentation um, summary of the board minutes for us to get approval um, for the exemption to section 520.1, which is the instructional hours. Um, under the Pennsylvania Department of, uh, Department of Education, an exemption 
is because the World Health Organization declared coronavirus a global pandemic. And that is an exception to the 990, 900, and 180 day um, um, hour requirement under the code. So, so we, we, in, order, in order to do any type of hybrid, we'll have to get you, your approval to the, the exception. So here's what I'd like to do now. Um, I know person, uh, Mr. Peart monitoring the email. We have a couple more comments that came in, so I'd like to hear those. But I'd also like to hear from our building, like you all to hear from our building principals and to just share out what the planning has been like, what the conversations have been like at their building. Um, and again, each building has just been a little bit different, but I wanna give people an understanding of how you know, we've taken this idea of this massive health and safety plan and how that starts to translate down into the building level. Because at the end of the day, that's what our families care about. What does it mean for them, their student and classrooms? And so I'd like to, to go around and have each of the buildings do that. But before we do that, let's have Mr. Peart read the comments um, and then we'll, then we'll hear from each of our buildings. Okay, uh, two more have come in. So the first one, I appreciate the challenge of the situation we are facing in putting this plan together. However, if the new plan with the AB schedule is anywhere close to reflecting what happened in the spring, our children should just continue summer vacation. There was minimal learning that occurred during that time. Is there any chance that we could revert back to pre-COVID school sessions this year if we begin, if we being with a hybrid situation? It isn't equitable for our seventh through 12th graders to only have two days of education a week. Tanya Lehman. Um, and the next one. Hello, I'm a parent with four children who attend Bermudian Springs School District. I have always felt extremely blessed that they attend a district where there's such a strong sense of community first. Reopening too soon is going to, dis to be a disastrous for our community. From the grandparents who watch their grandchildren before and after school to the families with children who are immunocompromised and every family in between. And based on the survey, parents will send their children to school without masks. To reopen too soon will cause lives lost and irreversible damage. If we stay closed longer than we need to, then shortcomings can be reversed and addressed. You can't retroactively save a life. Thank you for your kind attention to this matter and listening to, this, to the community. Jessica Lewis. Thank you, Thank you for sharing, for sharing. Um, um, with the first question about instruction in the spring. I'd like Dr. Dr. Fox to share, to share with you, with you um, the changes. Um, we, we, again, get that making the transition this past spring um, was challenging. I think we, that we did a, a really good job faced with, faced with what, what we were up against, but we've also learned, we've heard from the community, and I think it's important that everybody understands how it will definitely be different. I'll allow Dr. Fox to take that on and share with the community. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. It, it certainly, it certainly will, be, will different. be different. One of the things that we're currently working on is expectations of what that looks like from a learning management um, system perspective. But also the first thing is, is the importance of we, we, are, we are going to continue to, we, we will be grading, we will be assessing. Um, we, in fact, um, attendance will be required. There will be uh, clear attendance procedures in place. There will be both uh, synchronous and asynchronous opportunities for students, um, uh, you know, available as well. We have, um, you know, again, very clear guidelines that we're working for and working off of, um, and those expectations are, are set forth. In our uh, learning management system in, in Canvas, um, currently right now, our teachers are working through a lot of the course expectations that we established. Some of the course organization in, in our learning management system Canvas includes a homepage working off of modules, um, including the introductions, um, a discussion boards, using discussion boards, um, providing external tools um, when, when relevant, as well as providing direct instruction, both video and, and uh, audio. And this will provide a consistent framework for all of our users and all of our students. Thank you. Um, so now let's, um, let's hear from our building principals. And so let's start um, with elementary. And so Mrs. Ely, if you'd like to share with everybody um, what's happening at the elementary school and how you've taken all of this conversation into action planning at the elementary school. Sure. At the elementary school, we would be the only building that would be coming back um, with every student entering each day. 
which is right around 670 students at this point. So 670 students entering each day, not any of our classrooms are 18 or under, which would mean that at this point, we're planning for all students to wear masks for a majority of the day beyond just eating um, when they would be taking off their masks. We've developed a plan where students would be eating within their classroom um, because six feet apart in the cafeteria is only 90 students and we don't have any grade level that's under 90 students. Um, so looking at those things as well as individual recesses, we're currently planning on blocking off the recess into seven quadrants, allowing the kids to be within their own quadrant. Not using the recess equipment at this point is, is the plan. Um, so that's kind of the managerial aspect um, at this point, kind of working through what our specials would look like if we're not in a place where we're sharing materials and all of those things. Do students have individual material boxes that they carry with them? Do they travel to some of those specials? I think one of the things that we're working through right now is the computer lab, which makes it very challenging to utilize that special with 24 computers shoulder to shoulder at this point within the lab, um, which is embedded into their specials. And the students rotate through that throughout the day. So we've been really mindful of some of those things as we're planning. Um, Again, a classroom with minimal desks in it also allows for minimal furniture within the room, um, kind of preventing some of those things that the students are used to as far as grouping and guided reading and things like that. Um, that's something that will be new and, you know, we will certainly be teaching our kindergartner students to work through, but our first through fourth have been used to a different type of learning um, that we'll have to work with them on preparing them to to have a different type of learning when we come back face to face in the fall. Thank you. Now we'll go to Mrs. Myers at the middle school. Sure, so at the middle school, we're currently planning for two different models. Our grades five and six would be returning full time potentially our fifth grade uh, cohort classes um, would remain in the classrooms throughout the day and teachers would be traveling. Our fifth grade groups do have about 24 to 25 students per classroom. Um, so we would be needing to wear masks in the classroom based on the current guidance and throughout hallways. We would um, have created a schedule right now for fifth and sixth grades that they will be eating lunch in classrooms as cohorts. We have coverage provided so not only do students eat lunch in the classroom, but that the classroom teachers have the opportunity to have a lunch as well. Um, right now we're also working out how our specials courses would work with fifth and sixth grades, whether the specials teachers would be traveling to students or whether students would be traveling to specials teachers based upon the materials they might be using within the classroom. Uh, we will be creating one way direction hallways um, for students and also monitoring and coming up with a plan for bathroom usage for fifth and sixth grades. So with fifth and sixth grades combined, we're looking at about 270 students um, Monday through Friday. For grades seven through eight, um, we are bringing in half potentially on the A, B days, um, roughly about 150 students per day. Uh, with that particular scenario, they would be much smaller group sizes. We're looking at anywhere from nine to 12 students per classroom um, with very specific schedules and um, directions, uh, one-way directions and hallways. We'll be looking at how students can um, switch for their different courses in seventh and eighth grades. So in seventh and eighth grades with their certifications, they have they will they will be the teacher certifications by subject, they will be traveling to teachers versus teachers traveling to students. They cannot travel within their co within a cohort class. Um, so their schedules would look very similar in seventh and eighth grades to a typical school year in that they will travel to each of their different classes um, and their their groups may be mixed based upon the different classes that they're traveling to. Um, I also want to add that in fifth and back jump back to fifth and sixth grades. We also have built in a recess period after lunchtime in which the teachers will cover the recess and we will partition the playground area. Um, the blacktop pavilion area that our, our middle school students um, use or re attend recess on. Um, 
I know that the other conversation just from a physical aspect is that we've been discussing um, PE and how we can create opportunities for kids to be outside um, using all the different multi-purpose fields or the grass areas um, throughout the throughout campus so that they can still participate in a physical activity throughout the day. Um, grades five through eight, they would potentially um, have PE twice a cycle. Um, seventh and eighth grades are looking at a little bit of a different schedule, so that might look different for them, but for fifth and sixth grades, they would still receive PE and that opportunity to hopefully get outside. What that looks like if we're potentially inside due to weather, we're not quite sure yet. Um, so really the biggest difference for fifth and sixth, fifth and between seventh and eighth, fifth and sixth, all students are here, cohort classes, teachers are traveling, lunch in classrooms. Grades seven and eight, we're looking at the potential AB schedule. Um, they wouldn't necessarily need to wear masks uh, because they could social distance within the classroom based on their lower class sizes. And they would be traveling to different classrooms versus the teachers traveling to seventh and eighth graders. They also could potentially eat in the cafeteria. Again, this comes down to our definition of social distancing. If we're looking at six feet, needing to have six feet, um, we'll have to utilize the cafeteria and potentially our auxiliary gym in order to create space for seventh and eighth grade lunches. Um, in the event that we can utilize the three to six model, all seventh and eighth graders could eat in the cafeteria. Thank you. And then we'll finish up with uh, Mr. Defoe, high school principal. Let me start over. Is it we good? Um, yes. yes. Sorry, we were having some technical difficulties. So we're going to ask Mr. Defoe to start over uh, to make well, you sure. You guys let that me get a long way before you told me you couldn't hear me. You know that? <laughs> I, I've, I've never heard anybody say I can't hear you before. So <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so here is Mr. Defoe, high school principal. So at the high school level, the the uh, you know, the first goal in this process was how can we, you know, simulate something that's as normal of a high school day as what students had prior to the closure. And the hybrid certainly gives us that opportunity and it allows us to, you know, offer all the courses that uh, we would normally run. 
what will be a significant difference is kids will transition. Um, but the social distancing component and the hallway component, obviously, will be half the students we don't have to experience. We'll see any issues with that. We have uh, designed for traffic patterns that you'll always be on the right side. If after a few days, you know, that's a pattern that you know, there's, there's issues with that, then we have some adjustments that we can put in place to eliminate that moving forward. Um, the classroom issues really a mute point for us. Our class size is usually average 22 to 24. It will not be an equal split. Um, we've already looked at the current roster of students. And if we went with A to L in three grades and A to K in another grade, it would be as close as we can get to 50-50. The question is, will we want to have any confusion with one grade being a different alphabet breakdown or not? So we'll, we'll see what that looks like. But uh, the other component to that is uh, the, the students will move, the teachers will not move. Uh, the mask and the requirements for that aren't any different um, than what's already been shared. Uh, if you can't keep a six foot distance in it, then it will be expected and required. Um, the the huge component uh, I felt to the Adams County meeting that we attended last week was that was a very common thread and a common core across all the high schools across the county. It, it just be impossible to try to run a high school day that, that students don't move. So um, that's the component. The cafeteria, um, because of our layout and the three tiers, we have 15 tables on two of the three tiers and 18 on the one. And so currently, three students to a table with a seat in between each will more than accommodate any of the lunch shifts that we currently have. Uh, if that would become an issue again, then we talk about what would be the adjustments from that. Uh, the plan at, at uh, breakfast, you know, to start the day is the same as lunch. Um, based on the numbers of what we were serving the past two years at breakfast, we would usually be able to handle that with the hybrid. Because again, half the students, or roughly half the students, would be in the building. Again, if that becomes a problem, uh, then breakfast may become a grab and go and uh, you know, report directly to home uh, you know, at that point in time. Not a fan of the staggered uh, bell schedule or staggered send these kids and hold these kids. And, and, and the main reason why is if you do that, at some point they're going to arrive somewhere and then they're going to. So if we send, you know, say this hallway a minute before another hallway, at some point they're going to arrive and you're going to have a collection of students. So um, though we have four minutes in between schedules and our in between courses, um, it will not take any of that many minutes for that to be transition. It's considered a very smooth one. The next step was the, the very end of the creation of student schedules. We had conversation today as to what does that look like with the schedule change process. And then that we set two days Tuesday one week and Wednesday another for students to come. Talk to the guidance counselor about that today and we have some what their thoughts are and trying to settle on that or a shorter time frame. So the other component is I think the, the big challenge, I think you have to prepare as if you'll have all students and then every adjustment after that, at least at the high school level, become an easier process in terms of in building. Thank you. I will share with everyone, I know that that was hard to hear, Mr. Defoe, just a little bit. One of the other pieces next week when we um, push out the uh, approved plan and start to get feedback is our goal is to put together a, a video um, with clips from each of the building, putting forth uh, some just information about what you can expect. We'll put in some visuals. We'll also include into that um, an instructional component that applies to everyone across the district. So our goal is to put together a video that people can actually see and again, hear from our building our building principles um, with the goal even maybe to provide some visuals about what things may look like um, in the building. Shane, yes. I have a question about um, teacher aides. 
especially teacher aides at the remote learning. What happens to them? You know, to, to be determined, uh, the, the question was, if, if folks didn't catch that about teacher aides and support personnel, if we were to go to remote learning, if you recall back in the spring, Act 13 mandated how we handle that. Right now we have no, um, no edict. Um, and so our goal would be, um, what do we need to be able to support students, even if it's in remote? Um, and I think we were able to do some things um, a little bit differently in pockets this past spring. Um, but certainly some lessons that we learned, uh, students need um, more support sometimes out of academics. And so I would look to try to leverage as many people within the district to help um, in that model. Um, we also, lunches became a big deal. We served over 15,000 lunches in the spring remotely. And so our administrative team and uh, typically were the people out delivering those and serving those. And we had volunteers you know, providing those lunches. So we would also look to, to be able to provide that need and just leveraging people within the district. Um, but our ultimate goal would be to support students, whatever that may or may not look like. So that means people could be doing some things that they typically wouldn't do in the course of their, their typical job, but we need help doing something else. And so that's the goal. And actually, it's one of the things I love about Bermudian Springs, people help. If somebody needs help, we help. And that's been no different. People have, have, have stepped up and helped in a variety of ways. And so um, we will look to provide as many supports as we can um, using all staff members. Would we provide lunches under a hybrid instruction or just for the students in the building? Um, that's something that we've looked at um, about the possibility and what that waiver looks like. How, do we, how can we oper operate a, a remote site? And so the only way that we were able to provide that in the spring was USDA allowed districts to have a waiver. And so um, I haven't seen yet um, that they've allowed a waiver that would allow you to operate a school lunch program in a school, but also go outside. And so if that were the case, we've, we've certainly had conversations about if people wanted to come here to get a lunch, even though they're remote and go home, just grab and go um, as a possibility. But that has definitely been a conversation of of we, we recognize that it's important that um, we provide the opportunity to eat to our students. And if we did uh, full remote, we would be able to do it like we did in the spring. I, I would expect, again, that's gonna take the federal USDA program allowing us that flexibility um, to do that. Right now, that does not exist. So if we, if we self-impose um, to go 100% remote, we're gonna have to go and seek a waiver through USDA or push through the Department of Education, which, which has a, a broad, uh, districts can apply for a waiver of anything. It's really broad. But again, that's for Pennsylvania that doesn't, that doesn't apply to the National School Lunch Program, um, which is the, the, the USDA um, regulates. So Mr. Peart, I don't know if you have anything to add with regard to lunches. No, I mean, you covered it pretty well. I mean, right now we don't have the ability to do it. Um, depending upon what regulations and things would be. If we're forced to go remote, I would anticipate that it would, but right now I, it has to come from the federal government to allow us to do that. Um, so at this point, uh, that's the best we know right now. Uh, while, while you have the mic, um, I believe that we have another comment that came in yep. remotely. One more. Um, if enough parents sign their children up for Eagles Academy or cyber school, will, the, where the, will there be a change so that all students can be in school every single day? Will graduation date for class of 2021 be extended since the start of class has been extended? So we will be looking to, to present to the board next week a revised school calendar that would include a graduation date if we needed to change that. So what we're looking to do is try to make some shifts as, as much as possible. Um, what was the first part of that question? Uh, oh, yeah, if, if enough people opt out, um, how would we handle that? Um, you know, one, um, if we had to redistribute teachers right now, our teacher graders, it's an extracurricular contract. So we would look to leverage and, and actually as a way to accommodate some staff members to become graders and they become full-time remote uh, Eagles Academy teachers and provide support. But we would also look to, uh, from a face-to-face -face perspective, um, 
you'll be able to spread out in classes a little bit more, have lower class sizes by leveraging staff. So again, we're going to kind of let the data. Um, so we'll have a plan. It'll be approved. We're going to collect data. And the reality is we're going to have to respond and respond quickly. And so I don't know what that looks like, but we're trying to prepare as much as we can to respond. And I think, again, anything that we've learned is that we've got to be ready for anything and, and be able to adapt to uh, what's in front of us. So I would say anything's a possibility. Um, and we'll, we'll just kind of take it once we, once we look at the data. I do want everyone to know that um, the goal with gathering that instructional selection, we're looking to have um, back um, within a week or so. Ideally, we'd love to be able to on Monday, August 3rd, have the data to begin the implementation of the plan in our models. And so I share that because I want members of the community to know that, um, to be aware of that. Um, we also know that um, we're probably going to have to reach out to people that we didn't hear from because we want to make sure that we account for every family and every student so that we can appropriately plan. So we also need to be prepared to follow up with families who didn't respond to the survey so that we can get as, as large of an accurate picture as possible uh, for people uh, you know, to select their, their approach. And Shane, you said that we don't know yet what it looks like to stay open. If we open, we don't know if it takes one COVID case or five COVID cases. We don't know what the stay open plan is. Do you have any, I, like, I, can you look in your crystal ball and tell us when that's going to This is what I can look in the crystal ball. If people want kids in school, we need your help. We need, we need people to be responsible in where they're going in communities. Um, the reality is we believe that you need to be wearing a mask if you're in close proximity. We need good hygiene with washing hands. We need good sanitization. That's what it's going to take to keep our schools open and to keep them open, we believe. And so to try, and to, try to mitigate as much as possible, talk to, the, talk to our students, educate our students, be mindful and respectful of others, even if your views may differ. That's that, so my crystal ball says that gives us the best opportunity to stay open. And I think you can see nationally, everybody can see that. that that's, that's beyond Bermuda Springs. You can see what's, what's happening. As far as a, as a number, I, I don't. I don't know what the magic number is. I don't know what we're comfortable with, what we're not comfortable with. What I know is we're going to tap into experts. Um, we get that call that says we've got a case. I'm calling the Department of Health which is our direction, and we're going to start to get guidance. So depending upon what that looks like, we're going to look for them to guide us. Um, I'm not a medical expert. Um, our administrative team are not medical experts. We are going to have to rely on medical experts to guide us. That's why we're hoping that the Department of Health and Department of Education provide us pretty clear expectations of, of the processes um, to address that issue. Any other comments? So here's where we are. I, one, I really appreciate people staying with us um, through the conversation. It's challenging. And so right now, it's um, this plan is being put forward um, with a face-to-face K-6 to hybrid approach 7 through 12. However, we're getting feedback. We're getting input that we've heard. Everybody here has had an opportunity to weigh in. And so we will be putting in the effort as a health and safety team um, of taking that all in and coming up with a recommendation next week based on all of the feedback and any other information that we learn between now and then that will be put forth before the board and including the board will be able to continue to weigh in and provide your own uh, feedback as you continue to look at the detailed plan, um, listen to our, our families and we're gonna continue to take comments and we're gonna get, um, again, we're asking the community to provide feedback and, and comments um, using the form. I'll also say um, at some point we have to kind of have a get to a decision so we continue planning. There is nothing that prevents us from updating the plan at any time to change our approach. And I think what you've seen for districts that, that approved the plan early, and that was part of the caution, you've seen them have to change. And so it's kind of that fine line between gathering enough information making an informed decision to the best of our ability, and then developing plans to implement that plan. 
but also recognizing that as things change, we may have to go in to continue to, to update that plan. So I just want everybody to be aware of that. Um, I know that I, I greatly appreciate the thoughtfulness of the board, the efforts you put in to educate yourselves, talk to others and give perspectives. And looking around the room, it, I, I recognize it weighs on everybody. Um, and for us and our administrative team, it's what we eat, sleep and breathe every single day. And, you know, and I wanna thank them we all take it seriously. We've, we've put in a tremendous amount of time knowing full well that no matter what we do, any of us here do, we're not going to please everybody. It's just, it's just not possible. But I want everybody to know that we are going to make every, every effort to put the best plan possible forward. And so I, I hope that people appreciate that um, and understand you know, the situation that we're in. Um, and that's, that's what our real task is. So again, I just want to thank everybody um, for listening. Stay tuned for some more information coming out. And I really appreciate your time. So thank you.